Hey everyone, welcome to part two of the video. I hope you watched all of part one as this one picks up right where we left off. Get ready to really dive in and pick some things apart. Here we go. Now that the I.O. phone call is over, we can get back to the point of convergence, the moment Raquel claimed to have entered the condo. According to Amber, this was after yelling call 911 and while Johnny was continuing to pull her hair and strike and grab her face. She claims that Johnny seemed momentarily distracted by Raquel, which allowed her to break free from his grasp and move to the other side of the room. Then she states Johnny charged at her, apparently having regained his focus, but Raquel was able to run between them to stop his charge. I hope you recall what Raquel claims to have seen upon opening the door to the condo, because this, again, is where Amber's claims don't match up with one of her witnesses. I will go ahead and tell you, though. When they do agree on any action or occurrence while they were both present in the room, they really do agree. I mean, like, all the way down to wordage, verbiage, heck, even punctuation and hyphenation. It really is impressive. So just a little forewarning about that trend when I start to go over it. Raquel claims that upon opening the door, she saw Amber covering her head with her arms and hands while Johnny screamed at her. She does not confirm what Amber claims was happening when Raquel entered. Again, Amber claims that Johnny had her by the hair and was striking her and grabbing her face. And before you say, well, maybe he let go before Raquel opened the door, remember, Amber says it was only upon Raquel entering that Johnny seemed distracted enough that she could break free from his grasp, meaning it was still happening for Raquel to have seen. So here we have Amber and her key witness claiming two different things happening as Raquel opened the door and entered the condo. And it doesn't stop there. According to Raquel, not only does she not mention Johnny having a grip on Amber's hair and or face, but rather that Amber was covering her head while Johnny was only yelling. But she also claims to have ran right over to get between them. No mention of Amber fleeing to the other side of the room as Amber stated and Johnny charging. Just that Amber was covering her head. Johnny was yelling and she ran over and stood between them. So that doesn't really match up. And you want to know why, at least in my opinion, why I believe it doesn't? I'm about to tell you one of the biggest lies Raquel told through her entire declaration. That's because upon opening the door to the condo, like she claims, she actually saw nothing. To be clear, she saw something, maybe some coats or hats hanging up, but she absolutely did not see Amber or Johnny in the living room when she opened the door she claims to have entered through. Remember, this is the door she says she opened. It is the only entrance to the condo from the hallway and also easily the shortest distance from Raquel's condo. Raquel says she saw Johnny and Amber in the living room when she opened the door. But this is what you actually see when you open the door. If you notice on the floor plan, the living room is way over here and around the corner. Raquel not only wouldn't be able to see it the moment she opened the door, but would have to take several steps inside and turn the corner before even having it in her sight. Upon opening the door, she maybe saw a table, lamps, some pictures, a rug, and at best a portion of the kitchen, but she did not see the living room or anyone in it. And make no mistake, she does not mince words when she said she saw them in the living room when she opened the door. But something tells me she wasn't banking on someone finding out that this is a visual, physical impossibility. In my opinion, this adds to the possibility that this was not how or when Raquel entered the condo and adds more credibility to the idea that she was already in there and why Amber and Raquel's telling of what was happening as she entered slash opened the door are different. But don't worry. Now that they've both established Raquel as being in the condo and between Amber and Johnny, they get their stories back on track. Like eerily back on track, nearly word for word back on track. You see, now that Raquel is between the couple, both Amber and Raquel claim that Johnny slapped away Raquel's arms slash hands after she had extended them in a defensive manner while begging Johnny to stop as he yelled slash screamed obscenities at her. Raquel would then cover Amber to protect her. It was after this that Johnny picked up not just a bottle of wine, but a magnum-sized bottle of wine. Oh, did I forget to mention that the whole time leading up to this, while Amber and Johnny were having a peaceful conversation on the couch, that Johnny was apparently drinking from this very bottle. Oh, that's right. That's probably because Amber's just now plugging it into her declaration as well. But I digress. Anyway, according to both women, Johnny began to swing this magnum-sized wine bottle to smash everything he could. He would then charge slash storm at Amber demanding she stand up. He did this hyphen about 10 times hyphen getting closer, louder, and more threatening each time. Immediately thereafter they claimed Johnny's security team entered which included Jerry Judge but they stood back and did not say or do anything. Amber would yell for Jerry to help and that if Johnny hit her one more time she was going to call the police. 
They claim Jerry said, boss, please, and apparently nothing else, as Johnny continued screaming and breaking things before finally leaving the condo, going into the hallway where he would allegedly continue to scream and break things and smash another bottle of wine, even though it was never said he smashed the first bottle, only using it to smash other things. Whew. Okay. From here, they would both claim to hear Johnny go into Condo 5, which they describe as Amber's office, art studio, and closet for personal belongings. They state that they can hear Johnny inside the condo breaking Amber's things and screaming. It was only during this time that Josh Drew finally makes an appearance, apparently emerging from his and Raquel's condo to go and get Amber along with Raquel, with the couple taking Amber back to their condo for safety while Johnny was still in Condo 5, smashing things. I can only assume Elizabeth Martz was also in Raquel's condo because nobody mentions her location. Again, Raquel never mentions her at all, but she was on Amber's witness list to testify to what she observed that night relating to the domestic violence incident, so there's that. Also, I feel I must say, neither Josh, Drew, or Elizabeth Martz submitted a declaration. And with such eerily similar wording from these two separate declarations from Amber and Raquel, it is very much worth noting Amber wrote her declaration on May 26th while Raquel would write hers on May 27th, the day Amber submitted the application for the domestic violence restraining order. I just find it worth mentioning they were written a day apart and have such word-for-word -word descriptions the same. But back to it. It was during this time, while Johnny was still allegedly breaking Amber's personal belongings and Amber had been taken to Raquel and Josh's condo, that Raquel claims to have noticed Amber's alleged eye injury, citing both redness and swelling. Sometime after, not sure how long, they claim Johnny left the premises while they were still in Raquel's condo for safety. Amber simply says she did not hear him anymore, but Raquel says she actually heard him leave. It was after this that Raquel says she took pictures of Amber's injured face. These, along with pictures taken of the property damage, were submitted to court along with Amber's request for the DVRO on May 27, 2016. So let's rewind because I have questions, not enough answers, and things are really not adding up, primarily when important things like time and space or distance are involved. I want to start from the point Raquel claims to have received the message Amber sent asking her to come over. According to Raquel, upon receiving the text, she went immediately over, knocked, ran back to her condo to get a key, and was back to unlock the door in less than a minute from when she had left after having knocked. This tells me that if a trip from Condo 3's door to Raquel's condo to find and retrieve a key and back to Condo 3's door takes less than a minute, then we can assume the initial one-way trip of going immediately from her condo to the door of Condo 3 easily took less than a minute as well. To be able to approximate a length of time as being less than a minute, I would imagine it would have to be noticeably less than a minute, meaning you wouldn't likely say it was less than a minute if it were, say, around 55 seconds. Most people would just say about a minute. But Raquel made sure to specify it was indeed less than. So let's say, on the high end, the trips each, on average, took 45 seconds. That's 1 minute and 30 seconds total, again, on the high end. Now we have to account for the time she took the door before retrieving the key. Let's say it was a long 30 seconds of listening to them yell through the door and knocking before feeling it was urgent enough to run back for a key. Now we have, at most, a total of 2 minutes. You might be asking, why does this matter and where the heck are you going with this? And that's because, according to Amber and I.O., a lot of stuff happened in this brief, potential two-minute window. After the text was allegedly sent and received, Amber claims Johnny continued to rant in an aggressive and incoherent manner. It is not safe for how long he would do this, but then he would go on to demand Amber call I.O., even telling Amber his reasoning for his demand. Amber would call I.O. on speakerphone, and the call presumably went through. Io would go on to explain how Amber was calling him because Johnny was upset about something he thought someone had done to him. After explaining the situation, Amber asked if Io would talk to Johnny and try to calm him down concerning this thing that they said was untrue. You know, the poop in the bed thing. After this, Io claims Johnny flew into a rage. Amber claims Johnny ripped the phone from her hand and began to scream profanities and insults at Io over the speaker. Again, I'm not sure how long this went on for, but until Io was able to yell for Amber to get out of the house. Then Johnny winds up his arm like a baseball pitcher and throws the phone hitting Amber in the face. Amber covered her face. Johnny charged at her, taunting her, challenging whether the phone hit her, all while Io was still on speaker. Io could hear Johnny screaming, what if I pulled your hair back? Amber claims he did pull her hair as she tried to stand from the sofa. Amber begged Johnny to stop hitting her before finally yelling, call 911, and the call would then disconnect, but Johnny would allegedly continue to pull Amber's hair, grab her face, and strike her. All of this, all of these alleged actions, somehow supposedly took place in what was most likely less than two minutes. 
And that's not going into detail how long he spent cussing and hurling insults before even demanding the phone call to IO, how long it took Amber to call IO, how long Amber spoke to IO before Johnny's fit of rage, or how long he spent slinging insults at IO. Add all of that to the alleged physical and verbal actions while the call was connected, then the alleged physical actions that took place after the call disconnected, but before Raquel entered, and it seems like a real stretch to imagine all of that happening in less than two minutes. Not saying it's impossible, but man, that's a lot of stuff that would have to happen at lightning speed in order to be true. Next question. How in the heck could Amber and Raquel very specifically hear Johnny enter Condo 5 and yell and break things? Fun side note, these doors are self-closing doors. That's what this mechanism does. This so happens to be a picture of the inside of Condo 3, which has such a mechanism. We know that they each claim to have still been in Condo 3 while hearing him go into Condo 5 to break things before Josh Drew came to get them. But remember when I said make an important mental note about what Raquel heard and when she heard it? Remember when she stated she heard Johnny and Amber arguing inside? It wasn't until she got to the closed door that she heard them. And, if our math is correct, this would have been when Johnny was allegedly screaming over the phone at I.O. or at Amber while they were also yelling from the speakerphone and in the condo. That's three people yelling in the condo and she couldn't hear them from her condo or in the hallway, but only when she got to the locked door. So again, how were they still tucked well inside condo number three on the opposite far end of the hallway with yet another condo between them and condo five and a closed door how in the world could they hear Johnny, one person, not three people, all the way in Condo 5 and hear him breaking things and yelling? Also, quick question, what exactly did Johnny break in the hallway? Amber claims he smashed a second bottle of wine in the hall and Raquel claims he was breaking things in the hallway, but here's a picture of the hallway while standing in the doorway of Condo 3. You see what I see? That's right, nothing. These hallways are empty, devoid of anything to break. Sure, Amber says he went in the hall apparently with a wine bottle in hand and smashed it before going into Condo 5. Then why is this the only hallway picture among the court submitted pictures? No broken glass, nothing but spilled wine. Speaking of property damage photos, why are these the photos that were submitted with Amber's attempt to get the DVRO? According to Amber and Raquel, Johnny used a magnum sized bottle to smash everything he could. Raquel would even add that wine was going all over the walls, floors, and furniture, yet the only pictures we have are a wine spill in the hall and on a hardwood floor with an overturned unbroken bottle, a broken picture frame that they apparently took the time to hang back up at a perfect 90 degree angle before taking a picture of it, and finally a rug that looks to have been flipped upside down to show the stain on the bottom with what looks to be glass sprinkled on it. I would have thought there would have been a lot more debris given their description of destruction, these are a far cry from the damage they claim to have taken pictures of before the police arrived. Oh, what? I didn't mention the police came after Johnny left? Well, that's weird I wouldn't mention that. Know what else is weird? That Amber and Raquel didn't mention it in their own court-sworn declarations. Now, why would they omit that? That's right. The LAPD sent officers to the condo in response to Io's supposed 911 call. So what did the officers see? Well, according to their own separate depositions, they each saw essentially nothing. They claimed that Amber looked like she'd been crying, but saw absolutely no injuries on her face. No redness, no swelling, nothing. And remember, this was after Raquel claimed she had already taken pictures of Amber's injuries. So if this was Amber immediately following the alleged assault, and this was Amber several days later, she would have had injuries visible when the police showed up. But neither of the LAPD officers claimed to have seen injuries upon clearly observing her face. Even when asked what happened and if she needed medical attention, Amber's responses were nothing and no. The officers also claimed to have seen no property damage. No broken glass, shattered wine bottles, spilled wine, or other damage of any kind. After examining Amber and the condo, the officers left their card should Amber decide to call with any further details. So why did Amber and Raquel not mention the police coming in their own declarations? I would think that would have been an important piece of information. Well, once word got out the police did show up, Amber's response changed throughout the summer of 2016. Initially, after omitting it completely, she claimed this. They were in an adjoining apartment when the cops arrived to, to, to talk with her. Now, it would make sense to say this because the last they mentioned in their declarations, Amber was in Raquel and Josh's condo for safety. However, once the police stuck to their story of having observed the proper condo in question, Amber's story changed again, this time as part of an official statement from her lawyer claiming the officers not only saw the damage to the condo, but also the injuries to Amber. So first was, they didn't even go into the condo. Then when that didn't hold up, it became, 
Well, they saw it, but they must be lying for some reason. So why did these stories change so drastically, and what were they doing back in Amber and Johnny's condo so shortly after Johnny leaving with the presumed risk of returning, but before the police arrived? I have my theories. Speaking of stories changing, this isn't the only attempt at this tactic. When questioned why Amber didn't tell the police something had happened, she said it was to protect Johnny, but more recently, with Johnny's allegations against Amber as part of his lawsuit against The Sun magazine, and even more recently, his $50 million defamation suit against Amber, she claims she never filed a police report at the advisement of her lawyer, even though her lawyers threatened it on her behalf constantly. I suppose one could argue the initial interaction with the police was to protect Johnny, and in the following months before dropping everything, her lawyer was saying this to the media while advising her not to press charges or file a police report. Now, what kind of a lawyer would give that kind of advice if they believe their client is telling the truth? I should also note that recently, with newly released documents from Johnny's lawsuits, these ever-changing stories were something Amber allegedly tried to get others to take part in. Trinity Esparza, the head of desk staffing and security at the Eastern Columbia building, was questioned shortly after the alleged incident. She claims to have seen no marks on Amber's face leading up to the day she filed for the DVRO. In a deposition given to the courts, Ms. Esparza tells how Amber tried to get her and her staff to change their story and that she could use her friend at People Magazine. Yes, that People Magazine. The same People Magazine that was forced to retract a past story claiming Johnny was going to rehab, which was not true. Ironically enough, the same magazine that got the immediate exclusive interviews and photos from Amber about another alleged incident occurring in December of 2015. An incident in which my first video covers in detail if you want to know more about it and I haven't bored you to death already. Esparza and her staff stayed with their initial comments and even discussed not seeing her with markings on her face the days leading up to this picture. Since we are on the topic of what people saw and whether it matched up with what the submitted photos showed, let's talk about these pictures. I have a few questions. One, I'm questioning when exactly some of these could have been taken, and two, where. As to the first question, it's really hard to say. They claim these photos were taken sometime between the point in which Johnny left and the point the police showed up. I can't debunk the when of these photos, as according to new court documents confirming the hard copy photos given to the courts were not given in tandem with the original digital copies nor the original metadata, which would confirm the exact dates and times of the photos. By the way, why not submit the originals? Why submit copies, some of which look to have been altered with a stock filter from a phone app? So the when must remain up in the air for now, but the where? That's where things get interesting. I've already noted how odd it is that, among all the descriptions of damage Johnny allegedly caused, these are all we have. He apparently smashed, at minimum, two bottles of wine, but the only bottle we see is a bottle turned over on the floor, not broken with a spill. And before anyone says, maybe they cleaned up a little before they took the pictures, you must recall, they claim to have taken the pictures before the police arrived, and they also claim the police observed the damage, meaning these pictures had the potential to show much more damage in the condos and the hallway. That's if these damaged photos were even taken on this night or in the condos in question. Now, on to the submitted injury photos. I would say it's a safe bet to assume these photos were taken on different days, given the difference in hairstyle and volume, the different shirts, and the jewelry that is slightly different around the neck. I know they look the same at a glance, but they are indeed different necklaces. Also, the markings in these filtered photos are much more in line with Amber's appearance on May 27th after filing the request for the DVRO, but oddly enough, drastically different than the very next day, May 28th, after visiting her lawyer. So let's move back to this photo. This is the sole photo we saw submitted that presumably was taken moments after Johnny left while Amber was being kept in Raquel's condo for safety. You can clearly see the red markings Raquel describes in her declaration. However, I personally don't see any swelling. The eyes and surrounding areas on both sides of the face seem to be the same in terms of lack of puffiness or swelling. Interesting given that the phone allegedly struck Amber on this side of her face. Also worth mentioning is the angle of the line. The line marking what we can presume is supposed to be the outer edge of the phone is what looks to be at a near perfect 90 degree angle and flush against her face. Not saying that the phone could not have struck her this way, but when thrown is violently wild from the hands of an allegedly very drunken man, this is an incredible coincidence to strike flat against the face and at a perfect upright angle. Observation of her alleged facial injury aside, let me get to the main reason I'm showing this picture. According to Raquel's declaration, we were led to believe she observed the alleged injury on Amber's face while they had Amber in their condo for safety, taking pictures of said injury after Johnny had left. 
This has us assume the pictures of Amber's face, more specifically this picture, was taken in Raquel's condo. But where was this photo actually taken? Well, that's a question I can answer, and I can go ahead and tell you it wasn't in Raquel's condo as she would have you believe, and here's how I figured it out. I find it best to start by eliminating the condos that were obvious non-factors this night because, well, why would they go into a condo in which nothing took place just to take the injury photo? So that gets rid of condo 2 and 4. That leaves three potential possibilities. To figure out which one, it took a lot of digging and may take some long-winded explaining, but it will be worth it. As I previously mentioned, Johnny would eventually sell all five condos after the divorce. The collective units would actually go on the market in September of 2016, the month after Amber, having never pressed charges or filed a police report, dropped her entire allegations with prejudice, which basically means she can never accuse Johnny of it again and never seek legal action. Let that soak in for just a second. Anyway, the realty group listing the condos had taken several pictures and even video prior to posting the properties on the market. It is worth noting that by all accounts, this is very much the layout of the condos as they were while Johnny and Amber lived in them and also the night of the alleged phone throwing. I say this confidently because it was so shortly after the allegations being dropped and Amber, despite claiming to be homeless, was still seen residing in Condo 3 a few months later as late as December 2016, just one month prior to the divorce being finalized. So let's observe what else we can see in this photo and try and help narrow things down. The colors are somewhat muted, so let's saturate them. This way it gives us a better indication of the colors in the surrounding areas. Basically, this makes the color stand out more, becoming more prominent. We can now see that the ceiling above Amber's head is a nice shade of blue with an inconsistently textured paint pattern. This is a big observation considering each condo has a unique color palette and aesthetic. Of the five condos, there are some that have blue, albeit on the walls and not the ceiling. And then those that aren't really blue, but they do have that inconsistent textured look, meaning not a straight flat color. You might be thinking, well that gets us nowhere. I thought that too, but then I noticed that all of these condos have high ceilings. Well, at least on the first floor. The second floor of each condo has a much more standard height of ceiling, and if you notice, the ceiling above Amber's head is low enough to be visible in this up-close shot and also low enough to reflect the light from the lamp behind her, something that's not possible with the high ceilings of the first level of the condos, and none of the first levels have this blue textured paint style on the ceiling. Of all the pictures I was able to gather of the second floor of the condos, only one matched the ceiling in color and pattern. This one. This, believe it or not, is Johnny and Amber's bedroom. It is upstairs in condo number three. Note that not only does this color and pattern match the one from the injury photo, but also the ceiling is low enough to reflect the lamp light, even in a daytime photo. Something else I'm sure others have noticed is the lamp. Notice this pull here, hanging down from the shade. Look familiar? I'm sure some would argue that many lamps have things like this on them, but these look identical. We also have purple in the background matching quite a few things thematically in the room like pillows and paintings. And then there's something else in the background. It was really hard to make out until I was able to get a picture with a view from the opposite side of the room. Notice what is along the wall in the far corner, a shelf with various items on it. But what stands out the most is this. On the top shelf, it seems to be a basket of some sort weaved with an alternating dark and light color and checkered pattern. So if you would indulge me, I wanna try something.
Would you look at that? What looks to be the same basket on the top shelf of the same shelf at the end of a low ceiling with blue textured paint patterns. So it would seem Amber is standing about right here, just outside her bathroom facing this direction while the picture was being taken. So why would Raquel try to have us believe that this picture was taken in her and Josh's condo? Not only was this not taken in Raquel's, but in Johnny and Amber's condo, but also upstairs in their bedroom. So why, so soon after being allegedly assaulted and so soon after Johnny had left, but in the brief window before the police arrived, if it was indeed before they got there, why would you go back into the condo and go all the way upstairs into the master bedroom to take this photo? And why lie about where it was taken? Why lie about this and so many other things? If what is claimed to have happened is the only undeniable truth, why are there lies and contradictions all throughout? Well, I guess that's as good a place as any to wrap this up. I hope I haven't bored you too much. I understand that this was a lot of information and I found it really difficult to compact it all because I go into these videos understanding that some of those who watch them might not have followed this at all. Now, I do have my theories as to how I think things really went down, most of which can be pieced together through all the questioning in this video, but I'm not going to get into that because one, I can't definitively prove it, and two, it would just seem like I'm trying to sway people with storytelling instead of letting them come to their own conclusions based on the facts available. And I mean all the facts, not just one side or the side you wish were telling the truth. With that said, I hope everyone has kept an open mind, and keep in mind that these are perfectly reasonable questions to ask. They don't make you a bad person or any buzzword title that someone may try to throw at you or diagnose you with. I don't believe that taking these things seriously means making up our minds with the least information possible or because it's a popular opinion. A lot of things that ended up on the wrong side of history were once popular opinion. I think taking these things seriously requires you educate yourself as much as you can and don't turn a blind eye to something that may disrupt your original frame of thought. I trust that when something doesn't add up or make sense, you will at least ask questions. So anyway, everyone, if you want to check out my first video, which breaks down the other moments of alleged abuse and the lies told around them and questions raised, I'll link it here if I can figure out how. I can't thank you enough for giving this video a look. Again, if you want to share this, go ahead. Give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Leave a comment. I do sometimes respond to intelligent conversation, even the negative ones, but I try not to engage in too many meaningless arguments. Thanks again, and until next time, if there is a next time, take care.